Welcome to CNS Pathology. The first section deals with developmental abnormalities. Uh, we're going to begin our discussion with neural tube defects. Uh, recall from embryology that we've got a neural plate, and this neural plate will invaginate in order to produce uh, eventually a neural tube. Now, of course, up here are the crests of this invagination, and these are called neural crests, and so they would be located here and here. Um, important to note that the neural crests will go on to develop the peripheral nervous system, the wall of the tube goes on to develop the central nervous system, and the lumen of the tube goes on to develop the ventricles and the spinal cord canal. Now recall from embryology that the neural tube forms from the cranial aspect of the fetus all the way to the caudal aspect, so from the head to the lower back. And if there's a failure of closure of the neural tube, either at the cranial aspect or the caudal aspect, then that would result in a neural tube defect. And so we say here in the text that these arise from incomplete closure of the neural tube. It's important to note that neural tube defects are associated with low folate levels, but of course the key time is prior to conception. And so if you want to protect a woman against neural tube defects, it's important that she have adequate folate levels prior to conception, high yield. Neural tube defects can be detected during prenatal care, uh, and this is via an elevated AFP in the amniotic fluid and in the maternal blood. If the failure of closure occurs at the cranial aspect, we call that anencephaly, and it's characterized by absence of the skull and the brain. Now, if the skull and the brain are missing, then the eyes become particularly prominent, and that results in a frog-like appearance of the fetus. Here's an image of this, and you can clearly see that the skull and the brain, which should be above here, are clearly missing. And so this results in a prominence of the eyes of the fetus, which then results in this frog-like appearance. That's a very high-yield uh, description. Another very high yield association with anencephaly is the fact that it results in maternal polyhydramnios. Recall from embryology that the baby floats around in amniotic fluid, and the amniotic fluid is generated by predominantly from the baby's urine. At the same time, the baby swallows some of the amniotic fluid to help decrease some of the volume um, and then resorbs it. Now in anencephaly, because there's an absence of the brain, there's an absence of the CNS controlled swallowing centers, and so therefore the baby won't be able to swallow. And if the baby can't swallow, that's going to result in increased amniotic fluid or polyhydramnios. And that, and that again, is a particularly high-yield association. If there's failure of closure of the neural tube at the caudal aspect, we call that spina bifida. And the hallmark is that you fail to close the posterior vertebral arch. Now, this can simply result in a dimple or a patch of hair overlying that defect, and that's called spina bifida occulta. Or it can result in the meninges or the meninges plus the spinal cord herniating through that defect, and then that would be called outright spina bifida. When it's the meninges alone that comes out of that defect, we call that a meningo seal. When it's the meninges plus the spinal cord, we call that a meningo milo seal. Cerebral aqueduct stenosis is congenital stenosis of the channel that drains CSF from the third to fourth ventricles. Now remember that within the ventricles you have something called the choroid plexus, and that makes the CSF. The CSF then flows from the lateral to the third ventricle, and that's via the foramen of Monroe, and then from the third to the fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct. And so if you have cerebral aqueduct stenosis, then you will not be able to drain CSF through the ventricular system, and instead CSF will accumulate within the ventricles. This will result in enlargement of the ventricles called hydrocephalus, and because this is presenting in an infant, the head will then enlarge, and this will present with an enlarging head circumference. Dandy Walker malformation is a congenital failure to develop the cerebellar vermis. The cerebellar vermis separates the two uh, sides of the cerebellum. Uh, it presents as a massively dilated fourth ventricle with absence of the cerebellum, often accompanied by hydrocephalus. Here's a classic image, very high yield. I like to show this on examinations. You can clearly see that there is this massively dilated fourth ventricle with absence of most of the cerebellum. Arnold Chiari malformation is when you get congenital extension of the cerebellar tonsils through the foramen magnum. Just illustrating this very simplistically, if this hole represents the foramen magnum of the skull, then the brainstem is actually coming through that. Now, of course, posterior to the brainstem here would be the cerebellum. Now, imagine if the tonsils of the cerebellum extended through the foramen magnum, that would then be an Arnold Chiari malformation. Now, Arnold Chiari malformations can be divided into type 1 and type 2. In type 1, there really are no symptoms. However, in type 2, you can get obstruction of CSF flow. Recall that the fourth ventricle is right here, and so you can get some compression uh, resulting in obstruction of the CSF flow. So if there's obstruction of the CSF flow, that could result in hydrocephalus. That's an important association with Arnold Chiari malformations. In addition, a very high yield association is that 
You can also see meningomyeloceles with Arnold Chiari malformation along with, an, along with a spinal cord lesion called syringomyelia. And we'll talk about syringomyelia in just a few moments.